and head right, two and back, two left, stretch it out front and to the right, one, two, back, left, forward, now reverse it to the left, stretch it out. Oh, hello everybody, is everyone all right? Uh, yes, hello, I am all right, thank you. Um, a bit annoyed, a bit annoyed. Um, yes, after two years, uh, me and the household have finally succumbed uh, to the dreaded thingy bob. I've got COVID! Um, who could ask for anything more? Uh, May, that's O. Oh. Yes, I am on day... On day eight of COVID? Um, so that's fun. <laughs> but never mind. Um, so yeah, I ha it's not been too bad, to be honest with you. I've, I've had... I think the first sort of couple days were a bit grim and gross, but um, other than that I've just had a cough. And that's pretty much where we're at at the moment. Also, you may notice uh, this is still here. Um, I did say that I was going to cut it off, and I'm not a little liar. Um, I did think I was going to cut it all off, but I went to see my uh, my my barber, my barber, and um, I said, I think I want to cut it all off, but I'm sort of open to, su to suggestions, and he was like, well... And so instead he kind of just uh, chopped a bit off. <laughs> And kind of shaped it a bit. I suppose. Well, when I left the bar, when I left the barbers, he'd like put stuff in it, and it looked all because I'm worth it. But now, um, now it looks like the same as it did before. Like, Bleh. but um, no, I'm glad. I, I'm glad I kept it. I'm glad I kept it. Um, but that's not why we're here. So we've got a lot to get through. We've got ten books that I need to talk about. Um, this is both a February and March wrap up. Um, so first of all, let's do the February wrap up up up. And inhale. Stretch it out. So in February, I had a bit of a reading slump in February. I finished two books. Um, and was there any reason for that? Well, I was in a weird place in February. I was all over the place. And so, uh, yes, reading wasn't really on my priorities. Um, <laughs> of course, then the end of February happened with everything and perspective happened. So that kind of helped put things... In perspective. But I did finish two books, and the first one is this, The Grassling by Elizabeth Jane Burnett. This is a non-fiction memoir. Uh, it is, so Elizabeth Jane Burnett, she is a poet, uh, usually. This is like her, I think this is her first, like, sort of book that isn't poetry. Although the, the text is very, very poetic and lyrical and stuff. So it's a book that deals with, um, sort of preparing for the loss of a loved one. So her father was uh, terminally ill, and um, she's a she's Kenyan British British, um, so her mother I think is from Kenya, her father from uh, England, and um, and during this illness she she went to um, where he was staying, being looked after, which is where he also grew up um, in this place called Ede in uh, in Devon, in South Devon, which isn't too far from here actually, from where I am. And to try and kind of connect to her father more, she basically went around the countryside where he grew up and um, sort of tried to connect to the countryside and to the landscape in a very sort of visceral, physical way. So there's a lot of kind of lying on the ground and sort of have, being sort of face first in the ground and um, not sort of hugging trees, but it's sort of, it's very kind of getting getting fingers into the soil and sort of being really sort of close up and and kind of just yeah immersing oneself in the in in nature and in the earth and soil and stuff and some of the writing is phenomenal i mean just like it's really like i say it's nature writing up to the, up to the 11s and there's lots of stuff about um the soil and a lot of stuff about microbes and worms and bird life and stuff and um i haven't been to this part of devon but my my mum has, and she's kind of, she's sort of spoken about how, yeah, this this part of the world is very kind of like, ooh, has this kind of, ooh, sort of <laughs> side to it, which lends itself to this. But if you like sort of nature writing, then this is kind of the one, something for you, because it's, um, because, yes, there's something very, it's just very, very intense and very kind of, um, you can sort of f feel, you can, f you can feel the, the, the soil and the mud in your face <laughs> as you're reading it. It kind of reminded me a bit. There's a um, a clip by Leonard Bernstein, Bernstein, um, and he is rehearsing the Rite of Spring with this um, this youth orchestra, 
and he talks about this kind of stuff about kind of wanting to be immersed in the earth. Or just the feeling that one has in the spring sometimes of wanting to be immersed in the, in the earth itself. You know, you've all been through that. But yeah, no, it was just, it was an interesting one. Um, and uh, yes, I would recommend it is it is quite samey all the way through, but um, but no, I would recommend it if you if you like kind of non-fiction nature stuff. That's very kind of intense. And then the second book that I finished um, in in February was this, The Caucasian Chalk Circle by Bertolt Brecht. So why on earth was I reading Brecht? Well, uh, so I'm a playwright as well. Um, as well as other things, and every kind of two years or so, I will sort of write a new play, kind of on spec, as it were. And uh, end of January, I had finished something and I'd submitted it everywhere. And then in February, I was sort of thinking about it and I was like, have I written a knockoff Brecht play without realizing it? Um, because, because this, I've I've written something which is quite. Um, well, it has a narrator, and it's quite sort of meta. Um, stick a pin in that. Um, and yeah, and I was thinking like, this actually, that this might be the Brecht play. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I picked this up because I hadn't read. It's been a while since I've read any sort of Brecht stuff or seen any Brecht stuff. So the thing that um, Brecht is sort of attributed to is uh, epic theatre and kind of alienating the audience and all that. Um, and this is kind of as epic as you can kind of sort of imagine. It's um, it's very high stakes, it's very kind of grand and, you know, huge cast of characters and so you have a, um, a village which is being sort of ransacked and the governor is being dragged out to get killed and stuff and so the governor's family have to have to flee um, and the, the wife, the governor's wife, she, in the midst of fleeing, um, she's too busy to sort of worry about which dresses she's going to take with her that she forgets her her baby um, and so one of the servants sort of notices that the baby's still there and she's like oh ah! so she, she takes the baby herself and she sort of flees the, the city or whatever and then spends the next I don't know like sort of is it five years um, rearing this baby as her as her own um, and then at the end of the play um, we have this sort of face-off between the biological mother who wants her her son back and then this servant who um, has has basically been the the child's mother, and so it's this kind of argument between the who is the mother, and that's when the chalk circle bit um, comes into it. And if you know the King Solomon story from the Bible, then you have you pretty much know what the what the deal is. And so yeah, so it's a play about ownership, and it's a play about class, and it's a play really about um, I suppose really it's about socialism versus capitalism. Um, you have there's a prologue um, of the play, which is I think set in is it Georgia? Yes, Georgia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just a short pro prologue um, set in Georgia after World War Two, and they're trying to decide what they're going to do with the land. Are they going to go back to what it was before, where they had you know private ownership, or are they going to work together? And is is the land all going to belong to everyone? And they're going to work together. Um, and, uh, and they're sort of having a debate about that, and then this bloke comes on and the play is performed and stuff. Um, so yeah, so I found it very, very interesting. And um, I mean, based on this, <laughs> based on this play, and uh, from what I understand, from what I sort of remember of Brecht, um, no, I hadn't written a, uh, a knockoff Brecht play. However, <laughs> um, I didn't sort of uh, realise this until recently, but I was speaking to someone, I was telling them about my play and he was like oh it's like um six authors no six characters in search of an author and i was like is it he was like yes what's it what's the author's name of that I'll, I'll i'll put it here but um yeah so i haven't written a brex knockoff play but i've probably written a thingy knockoff play so so uh yeah i've got that coming in the post the six authors in search of a six characters in search of an author so i'm gonna read that and see if i've plagiarized it without knowing um so yes we shall see you but no, I, but yeah, um, it was interesting to revisit Brecht again because, uh, you know, he's just one of those people, isn't he? Okay, so here we have the March wrap-up. And breathe! And let your heels touch down! Large muscles in your thighs and hips are forcing great... 
So the first book that I finished in March was this, Swan's Way by Marcel Proust. This is uh, volume one of In Search of Lost Flipping Time, or um, La Recherche de Temps Flipping Perdu, as uh, the French call it. So this is a buddy read with um, a friend that I, I buddy read books with, and this was his idea. He he does have sort of sadistic buddy read choices, and this is his latest. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna we're reading all the way through it. So um, In Search of Lost Flipping Time is a four thousand page novel, which is a uh, quite handily broken up into, I think, six, I want to say, six volumes. Um, and this is the first. Um, yes, yeah, Swan's Way. So yeah, so In Search of Lost Time is uh, it's kind of like a, a fictionalised memoir, from what I understand of it, from Marcel Proust. Um, and this first volume um, is kind of a little bit unclear about the age, the ages that he's meant to be, but it's kind of pre, pre-adolescence. I would say... I would say it's sort of around eight or nine years old to about, to about 11, maybe. And yes, and this is pretty, this is heavy duty uh, modernism. This is the Moncrief um, and Kilmartin translation. Um, and yes, so it's, this is modernism with a capital modernism. Um, and it's basically all about memory and it's about, um, uh, yeah, trying to sort of find moments of memory, and and it's about going over the same memory for pages and pages and pages. So we start off with Marcel, Marcel, Marcel. Um, the first kind of 50 pages are about this single incident, sort of, where he is... Um, his, his, his parents are having a party downstairs, and he is obsessed. He's been sent up to bed, um, and he, obs he is obsessed with trying to get his mother to give him a goodnight kiss. And he's kind of, and he knows that this night he's not going to get one, but he's obsessed with wanting to get a good night kiss from his mother. Um, and he knows that if he goes down to ask for one, he's going, they're going to get angry. And it's this whole kind of like, oh, I want a good night kiss from my mama. And yeah, that goes on for fifty pages, and that's kind of one of the only thing that he remembers until he has a Madeline episode. Um, and what is the Madeline episode? Well, he he dips a, a Madeline, this is when he's older, he dips a Madeline in some tea. Um, I was going to do a bit and actually have a Madeline and, and do it now, but but no, can't do it. Um, he dips a Madeline in some tea and, and, and tastes it, and then it has this kind of reverse Raven Simone um, effect on him. He's like, <gasps> and suddenly he can remember all these um, different memories and stuff. So we go through different events of his life. He talks about uh, Mr. Swan a lot, who is his neighbour, kind of. Um, who is this very kind of, like, swarthy guy who everyone sort of fancies a bit. About halfway in the book, something very interesting happens. Um, that we have a novel within the novel. So uh, we have a big chunk of the book which is about Mr. Swan's backstory. Um, and his kind of love affair with this woman called Odette, Odette. And, uh, and yeah, it's all about this, um, this love affair which becomes more of an obsession. He, Mr. Swan, he, he becomes more and more obsessed and it becomes much more gaslighty and, and not, not nasty per se, but he just becomes very, yeah, he just becomes obsessed. And it's about obsessive love and it's about some kind of needy love and, and getting jealous and stuff and, and Odette kind of being really like, oh, I love you at the start, and then sort of realising, oh, God, you're a, we you're a weirdo. Um, and it's very intense, and it's pretty relentless. I mean, there's about 100 pages. Towards the end of that sec of that big section, it is pretty much the same thing being repeated for 100 pages, and it is fairly relentless. The only sort of redeeming thing that makes it readable <laughs> is uh, there's some very, very funny characters um, and that's the that's kind of the same in the whole book. There's some really funny aunts that Marcel has, um, and then there's this group of characters that uh, Mr. Swan hangs out with, and they're pretty funny. Um, but yeah, but that whole section is about Mr. Swan's obsessive love, and then the end is kind of um, we have this little um, coda <laughs> where we go back to Marcel, 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 and uh, we have this sort of beginnings of. Um, maybe the beginnings of this a similar kind of obsessive love that Marcel has for Mr. Swan's daughter, Gilbert. Um, 
And yes, so, so yeah, so really it's all about um, this sort of obsessive love, this kind of like, or needy love, like whether it's a little boy wanting a goodnight kiss from his mother and be like, oh, please, mummy, uh, to Mr. Swan, um, you know, a kind of 30 something man being like, oh, <laughs> um, to Odette. And then, uh, and then, yes, the same sort of thing happening with Marcel, with Gilbert, Gilbert. Yeah, so I found it, I did find it interesting, um, and I'm glad I'm reading it with someone who is far more <laughs> intelligent than me, and far more sort of, um, I mean, he's reading it in the original French, I think, which is interesting. Um, I mean, this, uh, this translation, it's pretty, it's pretty hard going, it is pretty hard going. Someone said that it's good, it's probably best that you only read it in sort of ten page bursts, and I thoroughly agree with that. Um, but no, I did find it interesting. I did find it interesting. Um, particularly kind of the Madeline moment. I mean, that's the kind of the famous bit in it, isn't it? Um, but no, but I'm interested because this is, I mean, this is going to be a, a year long at least project for us. Um, I am already, I'm a hundred pages into the second book, which is Within the Budding Grove. Buying secondhand books online is always fun because I'm buying the sort of the vintage versions, um, vintage publishing versions, and then the newer ones, they have these sort of really sort of lovely plant, plant covers, um, and I'm yet, I've yet to sort of get a copy which is like that, I mean, when this showed up I was like, oh hello, and then when this showed up I was like, oh hello, but yeah, we'll see. So yes, in search of lost time, we shall see what happens. Okay, so bringing it back up to date. So I read uh, this memorial by Brian Washington. I got this from a secondhand bookshop uh, in a town near me. <laughs> and uh, yes, I've heard a lot about this book. Um, this was released, I think in 20, was it 2020? It was released? Yeah. And I'd seen um, little bits and bobs about it. So I was like, all right, let's give it a go. And I'm glad I did. So this is basically kind of like the anti, it's an anti-romance story, um, or an anti-romance novel, I would say, say. So at the beginning of the book, you have Mike, who um, has his mother coming over to stay from Japan. Um, but as soon as she arrives, um, he says, actually, no, I'm going back to Japan to look after my dad, who is now um, seriously ill with, a, with cancer, I think. Um, so you're gonna have to stay, and Benson, you're gonna have to look after my mum. Bye! And so he leaves them. Um, and so, yeah, the first sort of section of the book is Benson, who is sort of left at home to deal with Mike's mother. Um, and it's this kind of situation where at first they, they're kind of sort of, not hostile, but they're kind of bit of sort of unease around each other and then they find a way to kind of live together and and sort of deal with each other. And then you have this other section where Mike goes back to Japan and uh, seeks out his his father who runs a bar and it's yeah it's about him trying to sort of connect with his with his dad again. Um, and so yes and the relationship between the two when uh, we, we sort of get these flashbacks of, um, of how the relationship was and how it is now and stuff and it's sort of on it's kind of on rocky ground, to say the least. It's an interesting book about kind of identity and stuff and um, and looking kind of at a relationship that they sort of fell into, but kind of there's good things about the relationship, but there's kind of things that really kind of they should have broken up a long time ago, maybe. But is there enough to kind of, you know, to, uh, to hold the thing together? And yeah, I, I thought it was really, really interesting and really kind of... Uh, and really sort of well well done. Um, it's told in the first person from both the characters and um, I, what I really liked was the the difference in voice um, and the difference in style when you sort of flip between the two characters, so I thought that was great. Um, in my recent Q&A I said that a character trope that I really like is um, sort of older female characters who are scary but on your side and um, Mike's mother, I can't remember what her name is now, but she's I mean, she's not old, but she's um, she's kind of like this late middle-aged woman who is a bit scary at, at, to start with. She's very kind of like, you know, in this sort of in this kind of angry mode, which is kind of understandable given the circumstances of the book and what um, her son did, does. 
but um but over time she sort of uh yeah she sort of not warms up but she kind of becomes more and more likable as the book goes on and stuff and so i really like that um i also like that it was a it was a book about a interracial relationship which didn't which was about two people of color um so it wasn't a book about white guilt in a relationship you know we're all or any of that sort of stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with a book about that, but um, it was just refreshing to sort of see a book tackle these um, issues um, differently, um, which I liked. It kind of has a style which um, I'm seeing a lot of novels, not a lot, but I'm seeing a few novels take, which is these sort of short, these sort of short bursts. So these sort of, it's not a vignette novel, like weather or no one is talking about this, but it's just um, these sort of little, these little bits, these little quippy bits, which I'm noticing more novels do. I mean, there's a lot of chapters like that, all this sort of like one sentence chapters, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm interested that more and more novels are kind of taking that approach with, you know, making little, little bits instead of, you know, instead of flipping Marcel Proust going Aah! So yeah, but no, I, I did enjoy it a lot and I would recommend it a lot because I thought it was interesting. Um, and yes, I'm very well done. So there we go. Okay, next up I read Grey Bees by Andre Kirchhoff. Um, so, I, so I read this for obvious kind of reasons. Um, Andre Kirchhoff, he's a very well-known and sort of respected Ukrainian novelist. Um, and so I was sort of interested to read one of his books. Um, I think his most well-known is Death and the Penguin, I think, which is meant to be quite sort of surreal. Um, and this is his latest one, which was published, I think, in 2020, I want to say. Uh, 2018, but it's got a foreword that was written in 2020. But no, but I decided on this one, Grey Bees, because I was interested in, in the premise. So basically, this is set around, I want to say, sort of 2016-ish, I want to say. And it's set in the what's known as the grey area um, in between Ukraine and Russia. Um, I think specifically it's in Donetsk, I think. Um, I think that's right. Um, so we have a beekeeper who is one of the only residents left in a sort of abandoned village. Um, it's him and another guy who lives on the other side of the village. And this other guy is his childhood enemy. Um, I mean, they're fine, but they sort of have a kind of, um, not a rivalry, but there's something, there's a little bit of tension between them. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're, they're the only people left in this village which has been abandoned. Um, and in the distance, uh, you know, you can hear um, shelling and fighting happening between separatists and, um, and Ukrainians, fighters. So the book starts um, sort of at the end of winter, turning into spring, and... Um, this beekeeper, I think his name is uh, Sergovich. I think that's I think that's his name. Um, he he realizes that his bees, when they sort of come out of hibernation, there's not going to be any food left, so he's going to have to take his bees elsewhere. Um, and he remembers that he has this sort of um, long lost friend who lives in Crimea, and so he decides to pack up his bees and go on this sort of road trip down to Crimea and see if he can find this uh, long lost friend again. And so yeah, so the novel is basically about this road trip and what happens and then him arriving into Crimea, which is of course under Russian, which is now uh, part of Russia, and him finding this man's, this long lost friend's family and yes, or dealing with what's kind of happened, happened with him and stuff. And so yeah, so I was really fascinated reading this and I mean, I think the the, the foreword that um, Kirchhoff wrote in 2020 is really kind of like, uh, it's really kind of um, unsettlingly prophetic, I guess. But the novel itself is this interesting look at the people left behind in these kind of grey areas and, you know, places which, which have been ravaged by war. And then, you know, you sort of have these people which are kind of left to pick up the pieces kind of thing. Um, and so he has these encounters with soldiers with severe PTSD and he has encounters with people who yeah who are being sort of targeted you know because of you know their heritage or whatever um so yeah I thought it was really uh, yeah it was just a very interesting read um it's not I would imagine some people might be a bit hesitant to pick this up because they might think it's too close um to what's happening at the moment 
Um, and what I'd say to that is that um, this isn't about the harrowing um, immediate stuff of war. This is about the war is never kind of in your face. It's always kind of like over the horizon. Um, and this is kind of more about the places where war has been um, and kind of what's left behind kind of thing. Because I don't know much about the history of, you know, Eastern Ukraine and and the grey areas and stuff. And so just reading it and also reading the foreword and listening to interviews that he's given, it was just kind of interesting because, yeah, there's something about reading fiction um, as opposed to non-fiction just sort of puts you in into a different sort of frame of mind. I don't know. But no, I, I, I'm glad I read it. I do want to read Death and the Penguin because um, I'm sort of interested in his work a bit more now. So yeah, there we go. Right. So I was feeling a bit warm, so I've uh, I've taken my uh, my jumper off. Okay. So um, next up, we have a women's prize for fiction long list book. I read The Island of Missing Trees by Alif Shafak. Yes, this is a book that I've gotten from the library. Um, but I will definitely be getting my own copy, and probably I will be getting a hardback copy because look at this dinky little hardback. I like, I like hardbacks which are like this. Um, yeah, I, I, I like it. So this is fabulous. This is really, really fabulous. I really like this a lot. So again, this is about a period of history which I didn't really know anything about, anything about really. Um, so this is about. <laughs> this is one of the weird ones of the Women's Prize for Fiction long list of which I have more to come to talk about. So we have a dual timeline plot. We have um, Ada, who at the beginning of the book, she is um, she is a teenager living in London in the late 2010s. Um, and at the beginning of the book, she has she's dealing with the, um, the loss of her mother um, a year previa, previous. And she's having a bit of a hard time at school. And she has this uh, big kind of breakdown, meltdown at school. Um, and, uh, and yes, she's sort of like brought home and stuff. And her single parent father, single parent father, is um, is getting his fig tree in the garden ready for a very sort of harsh winter storm, which is coming. And so he's doing what I had never thought possible, <laughs> but he's burying the fig tree. Also to kind of come and help for that Christmas is um, Ada's aunt, um, so her mother's sister, um, is coming from Cyprus to uh, to help with things, and Ada at the start is kind of she's a bit kind of wary of this of this woman because um, she hasn't met her before and she wasn't there for her mother's funeral and stuff, so she's a bit sort of wary about her. She doesn't really like her that that much. Um, but yeah, over the course of the novel, you know, it's about you know her trying to sort of connect with her father as well as this aunt um, and sort of learn the history of the family. And this, the other timeline then is set in the 1970s and it's basically the story of how the of how Ada's mother and father got together um, uh, in Cyprus. So it's kind of a Romeo and Juliet type thing going on with them. Um, so the father, I can't remember their names, but the father is comes from a sort of Greek Christian background and the mother comes from a Turkish Muslim background and obviously you know they can't there's sort of increasing tensions between those two people peoples um, so they can't sort of be seen to be together so they go to this restaurant um, to meet up um, and in the middle of this restaurant in the courtyard is, is a fig tree um, and yes so they sort of uh, they try and have this kind of uh, relationship whilst war is about to break out um, and the other thing about this novel is that part of the book is narrated itself by the fig tree. Um, and so the fig tree gives um, a very kind of, it gives a kind of an overview, it gives a political, um, philosophical overview of what's happening. Um, and yes, and that's basically what the book is about. And it's very, really rather good. It's really, really good. I really liked it a lot. Why did I like it a lot? Well, I think it's just the writing style. I mean, the fig, the fig tree chapters are really, really fascinating because it gives, it gives an opportunity both for a bit of oogie bougie, but um, also it just um, it helps to kind of frame this very sort of difficult conflict um, in a sort of philosophical way, which is very kind of. 
just, I don't know, it's very, very engaging. Um, and, I mean, the story, I mean, yes, it is a kind of tells all the time Romeo and Juliet type plot. Um, but, I mean, it doesn't only just focus on their teenage years, it focuses when they're kind of in their 20s as well. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting book about um, about sort of trying to find out who you are, trying to find out who your parents are. Um, it's about love and about, um, again, it's about identity, I guess, as well. Um, and yes, it's it's really rather good. Um, there's a couple, a couple of things that I wasn't too thinking of about it. Um, I have yet to find a book to read a novel about something that goes viral, which, which to me sort of seems believable. So, uh, so yeah, something in something that happens goes viral, and I don't know. It always kind of makes me go, oh, "Here we go," <laughs> when something goes viral in a, in a novel because it never really sort of rings true, or it kind of never really kind of makes sense how it sort of plays out, um, and that's kind of what happens in this. And also, it kind of it's a big deal, and then it kind of sort of peters out, and it doesn't really matter anymore. And from the way it goes viral, this event. Um, and how sort of widespread it's sort of meant to be. I, I don't know, I just sort of felt like, oh, well, hello. And then the only other thing that I wasn't so sure of was the very, very end. The very, very end kind of annoyed me a little bit because there's a there's a reveal. This is kind of, I'm not going to say what it is, but it's kind of like on the very last, it's, I think it's kind of on the very last page or something. There's a reveal. And I was like, oh, we didn't need that, Alif Shafak. <laughs> Um, I think it's meant to be, what it's meant to be is this sort of moving, sort of, oh, and but it's really this. And I was like, well, I, li I liked it before. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, when I reread it, I'm kind of going to sort of miss the end, <laughs> the very end. But no, I, I really liked it a lot, and um, I think it has a very big chance of, uh, I would be very, very surprised if it's not on the shortlist. I'd be very surprised if it's not on the shortlist, because I think it's uh, really, really fabulous. I'm going to get myself a, my own copy, I think. There's a fly in my coffee, dear Liza, dear Liza. So after that, I had read two books about uh, real-life conflict, and I was kind of in a mood where I needed something a bit more low stakes. So I read A Room with a View by E.M. Forster. Oh, I love this book. So, ah! so I, I know the story of A Room with a View fairly intimately. <laughs> because um, I am a massive fan of the film. I have seen the Merchant Ivory adaptation of A Room with a View very many times. <laughs> I could quote the whole film at you, but I'm not going to. One more lump if I might trouble you, Mr. Beeb. Never heard of it. I could literally go on and on and on. Um, but I'd never read the book. And I saw this in a charity shop, um, and I was like, oh yes, let's, let's pick it up. And uh, this was like the perfect time to to read it, as I needed a kind of like a... Oh, book. Um, and it's very, very short. I didn't realise it's less than 200 pages. So what is this about? This is about a young woman called Lucy. Lucy! Who is in a bit of a muddle. Um, so the first half of the book, she goes to Florence with her older cousin Charlotte. Poor Charlotte. Um, and she meets there um, a young man called George, who's very sort of swarthy and very sort of like... Ugh. And uh, she has a little bit of a sort of something-something with him in a field. Um, an interrupted piece of something-something in a field. She sort of, she's totally overwhelmed by this kind of, by this sort of event. Um, and in the second half of the book, she um, becomes engaged to Cecil, who is this very, very proper, prim and proper uh, man. And, uh, um, and, in, and through sort of... Um, fortuitous events, uh, George sort of shows up in the village where they are, um, and it's like, oh, should I, should I go with my passions, or should I go with, with my sort of, with, with Cecil, and, uh, yes, it's a really fabulous book about, um, about following your passion, uh, yeah, it's about being, following your passion, and following your impulses, it's about class, it's about, different cultures um, clashing. It's about how a kind of really sort of passionate um, love and a kind of like a life, how, how can you have a sort of life, life, very life of life, passionate love, love, love um, within this kind of very prim and proper sort of 
social more mores mores this is kind of Italian fieriness Florence um kissy kissy how can that kind of be contained how can Lucy be contained in the kind of the very rigid British English things that uh that she's confined by so yeah it's really rather good and I loved it a lot I think this is going to be um one of my favourite books of the year. I really do think that. Because um, there's something about... I mean, the film... Having read the book now, the film is, like, really... There's not very many places where it kind of deviates from the book at all. Particularly with the dialogue. It really sort of lifts the dialogue out of the book. Um, and what the one thing... Because the thing about the film is, is that... Um, you have these two, the, the Emerson, so you have George Emerson and then his father, and they're kind of these two weird, oddball characters. Um, and they sort of say, I mean, the the father particularly, he says these kind of really sort of oddball, kind of weird things, um, which in the film are kind of quite funny, but in the book they're sort of expounded upon a little bit more. And it becomes much more, it becomes much more of a philosophical, like, um, yes, this is the life, the very life of life. Um, I was interested that in, because in the film he's very, um, he's sort of clumsy and a bit sort of like klutzy and stuff. But in the book he's much more sort of um, forthright and much more kind of like, um, yeah, so much more forthright and no, this is what this is what it's meant to be. But I, I do still, I mean, I still love the adaptation a lot, and, and I like it. I think I like it even more. Um, I mean, it's cast. I mean, it's really, really cast very well. Some people don't like... What's his name? Is it Julian Sands, who plays George? Um, some people think he's not good casting, or he's not a good... He doesn't give in a good performance. And it's a weird performance. I'll, I'll give them that. It's, there's some, some odd line deliveries. Um, but I don't mind... I don't mind <laughs> Julian Sands in that part. I mean, he, it is different. I think... It does feel different in the book. Um, he's not so sort of weird in the book. He's just a bit kind of morose <laughs> in the book. Um, whereas in the film, he's sort of more like, Ooh, and sort of, you know, shouting on top of trees and stuff. <coughs> yeah, he's he's quixotic and it, he's a bit kind of like, Ooh, but he's not he's not weird. Um, but in the film, he's a bit weird. Um, but I still I still like the performance and, you know, um, but yeah, no, really, really funny, really, really fabulous. I would thoroughly recommend it, and it's definitely going to be one of my favourites of the year, I think. Lucy! And also Charlotte um, Bartlett is one of the best characters ever. Get dressed, dear, or the better part of the day will be gone! Uh, next up, I'm not going to talk too long about this, but I read, I sort of read uh, August Osage County by Tracy Letts. Um, so yeah, I didn't read this cover to cover, I sort of went in, in and out of it a little bit. So yeah, I picked this up because I had seen the Netflix... The Netflix. I'd seen the film adaptation of this on Netflix um, with Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts and everything. And I suddenly remembered, I was like, I think I've got the play text of that. And I had a look, and sure enough I did. And I was like, ooh! So yeah, so I didn't um, read it cover to cover, but I did sort of look to see what was different and what wasn't. Because uh, Tracy lets he... He helped to write the uh, the screenplay of the film, and so I was interested to see what he had, you know, cut, because this is a three hour plus play, and the film is two hours. So I was interested to see what he'd cut, and what he'd, they kept in, and and stuff, and um, and yes, I was very sort of fascinated. It's, it's one of these things, I mean, the film is okay, it's not amazing. Um, I mean, the play itself, I mean, this is like a Pulitzer Prize winning play and stuff. Um, and I didn't see it. Um, it was at the National. The original production was at the National years and years ago. And I never saw it, but I, had fr but I know friends who did, and they were like, It's amazing! Um, on YouTube... <laughs> yeah, someone has filmed most of the play and put it on YouTube. Um, I think it's the original production, which you shouldn't do, but it is kind of interesting to watch. Um, so I did have fun kind of comparing um, the film and the the play version, there's sort of certain things which I thought was sort of interesting. You don't get it, do you? You don't get it. I am running things now! You don't get it, do you? I'm running things now! <laughs> Reading it is interesting. I mean, the dinner scene, I mean, look, there's like a whole 
you have like a section whole different people talking and stuff and and yeah people like going off everywhere it's really kind of interesting to watch the play version on youtube which you shouldn't do but never mind um so yes but uh, yeah I'd, 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 I'd sort of recommend the film but it's kind of it's a bit it's not really it doesn't really have a sort of bite the film i feel um i mean every i mean meryl sort of chews the furniture up as you kind of imagine and she's amazing but um the film as it the film as it is it sort of just doesn't have a I don't know, it's it's all very sort of la la la, and it shouldn't be, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so we have two more uh, books to talk about, and these are both women's prize for fiction long list books. Um, so another book I got from the library uh, was this, Quick This One Sky Day by Leone Ross. This is a big sort of chunky book, a uh, big hardback book. Um, and very sort of very nicely put together, favour and favour. I, I must say, look at this, very, very nice, oh, very nice, oh, very nice, very nice, oh, very nice. So I was excited by this one. Um, however, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, this didn't end up being one of my favourites of this month, which is interesting to me. Um, so this is a magic realism novel with a capital magic realism. Um, in the US, I think the cover and the and the title in the US is much better. In the US, it's called Papisho, which is where it's set, um, and the cover in the US is gorgeous. So this is about um, an archipelago called Papisho in the Caribbean, and it's a group of islands where um, it's kind of sort of X Meny. Um, so you have everyone is born on these islands with. Um, what is known as cause or magic, basically, and um, and the magic can be anything from having an extra limb, from having having wings, or it can be more a kind of like a power thing where you can change the flavor of food, or you can read people's minds, or heal people. You know, it's kind of it's a huge, sort of wide gambit of what you can be born with magic-wise. But basically, you have. It's basically a love story. You have these two characters who um, were sort of meant to be together, but through various circumstances um, uh, drew apart and sort of got married to different people. Um, and this book is set over one day as one of these characters, the guy, he is preparing a meal for this wedding that's going to happen. Um, and <laughs> as certain things go down... Uh, sort of events sort of lead them slowly and slowly, sort of closer and closer. Um, and uh, the events that go down are fairly bonkers. One in particular in the middle of the novel is kind of hilarious and sort of ridiculous and kind of, yeah, it, it's very, <laughs> it's something that happens with the uh, with the women of the island and it's kind of like, oh, that's that, this is what's happening with the book, right. So yeah, so I like, what I liked about it, I liked the audaciousness of it. I liked the imagination of it. I liked that there was a whole... that she thought really carefully about the 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 political structure and the hierarchical structure and who does what and who's expected to do what and um, and all this sort of thing. I really liked that and I liked sort of the, the detailed thing of it. But there, for some reason I never really vibed with, with it and I don't really understand why because it is a book which I should enjoy um, and I was thinking, like, well, yeah, because I like magic realism novels, so I don't know why I didn't sort of vibe with it. But then I was thinking, do I actually like magic realism novels? Because I I say I do because I like A Hundred Years of Solitude, but then books that I've read sort of subsequently, like um, The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree, I, have this, I had a sort of similar issue with that. And I think it's because something weird happens on every single page. It's just something about... When so many things can happen that are weird, for some reason it kind of it kind of le lessens my interest a bit. For for some reason, like I I really like the imagination of it, and I love that you just don't know what to expect from page to page. But for some reason, I just I like it if it's just a little bit pared back. I need to reread Hundred Years of Solitude again because um. Because I know that there's there's tons of stuff in that that kind of don't make sense, and that there's tons of weird, wonderful things that happen. But from what I remember, it kind of it's sort of paced a bit 
it's it's sort of paced well and I don't know there was something about this and it, it's a hefty novel I mean it's a, it's a big old chunker but um but yeah there was a certain point I mean I remember once you get past the middle bit with the with that thing that happens with the women then it kind of just it sort of plods along and I was like and so, you know weird stuff happens and everything and I was like well I don't really I'm not really sort of invested for some reason so um I don't understand. if it got shortlisted I would definitely understand why it got shortlisted um and maybe I would sort of have another go I mean if it won if it if it did if it won the uh, the wins prize then I would definitely give it another go but um as it stands now um it wasn't one of my favorites which is weird because I mean don't take my word for it I mean I would still recommend it because tons of people do like it love it a lot um but yeah just something I just didn't vibe with it for some reason I don't know why I don't know why and then the last book that I read in March of this year uh, was this, The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. Uh, so this was given to me, I was uh, given this uh, copy by the publisher, uh, Canongate, which I was very, very grateful for. Um, they gave me this, and then they also gave me a t-shirt with a kind of very irreverent, oh, um, sort of slogan on the back of it, which I was like, oh, all right. But you no, know, I was very grateful. Um, yeah, so thank you, Canongate. And uh, I read this fairly quickly. I mean, this is... It's a very... It's a fairly long book. I mean, this is... F oh, yeah, 550 pages. Um, but I read it fairly quickly. So, again, this is one of the weird ones of the long list. Um, so it's, uh, again, sort of similar to Island of Missing Trees. We have a teenager who is dealing with the... Um, dealing with grief, dealing with the death of one of uh, their parents. So we have this young boy called Benny... Um, 14 year old boy called Benny and his father at the beginning of the book dies in a very sort of freak uh, ridiculous uh, truck accident um, and soon after so he's living with his um, with his uh, single parent mother who's um, a bit of a hoarder um, and soon after the death of his father he starts to hear voices um, and he starts to hear the voices of objects um, everywhere yeah, each object has its, has its own voice, which is sort of trying to get Benny's attention. Um, and he eventually finds a bit of respite in the local library, um, where he sort of meets a couple of kind of interesting, quirky characters. And this obviously attracts the attention of doctors and, and psychiatrists and people who sort of try to diagnose what's happening with him, because it's kind of affecting his school life and his home life and, you know, a child saying that he can hear voices is going to, you know, cause some concern. Um, and also because these voices eventually kind of get him to do kind of things that that uh, threaten his safety and stuff. So he gets put into different um, wards and stuff. One of the interesting things about the book itself is that it has a, again, a very sort of meta uh, thing about it. In that there are little bits where um, Benny as a character kind of interjects. Um, interjects proceedings with um, with stuff, um, and then the book itself um, responds to Benny, um, and that could be a little bit gimmicky, but it's I thought it was just really sort of these sort of moments of kind of meta, these sort of meta things where Benny's like, "Can we not talk about my parents' sex life?" And the book is like, "Well, we need to discuss, you know, <laughs> your parents' love affair and stuff." Um, and yeah, I just thought that was really I I love it when books when authors sort of do something like that which is a bit sort of weird and a bit sort of interesting um yeah so the book itself is talking to Benny as well as narrating his life it's just very it's just very interesting so I like that a lot again this book I sort of vibed with it I mean I vibed with it more than I did once this one sky day um it is a long it is a long book I don't think it needs to be 550 pages it could you could shave 100 pages off that easily there's a few things that I wasn't too fond of so there's a character called the Aleph um, who's also known as Alice um, and she she's a character she's a bit on the nose as a character she's got this uh, she's got a non-binary ferret and she's um pet non-binary ferret and she's very kind of um, social, politically aware, and she has these speeches about capitalism and climate change and stuff. And I don't know, as a character, she, I was just like, mm, whenever she sort of went on these sort of little 
diatribes about stuff. I was just like, this is a bit on the nose, Ruth Hazeki. There's things that I really liked about it. I mean, the other thing that I really liked about it is that there is a, a book within the book as well. So Annabelle, uh, Betty's mother, um, she's, she's a hoarder. She's really struggling, you know, to cope. She's sort of at the end of her rope. Um, and this, this book um, called, I think it's called Tidying Up. It's a kind of a, um, oh, what's that book that came out? Oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's a book like that, um, where you know, sparking joy. If you if it, if an object doesn't spark joy, then you get rid of it. It's kind of one of those books. I did like it overall. I did like it overall, but I think it's just it it went on a little bit too long for me, and there were just things that, as I say, like like that character, which was a bit on the nose, um, and I thought which could have been done a little bit more subtly. Um, but um, but no, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I like the fact that the sort of the magic bits of it, you can kind of in, it's sort of up to you to sort of interpret to interpret kind of what is going on with that, whether it's real or whether it's um, you know, a part of a sort of neurodivergent illness that he has or whatever, whatever. So I thought that was interesting. I'd be interested to read another one of her books um, because even though I wasn't so like enamoured with this, um, there is something about her writing which which when it's not preachy is really kind of like, ooh. But um, I think out of the books I've read, because I've read four now, I've read, I think my favourites of the four I've read so far are Great Circle and The Island of Missing Trees. And then these two um, aren't so much of my favourite, but I, I prefer this a little bit more than this one, Sky Day. But um, no, I'd recommend it. It's kind of interesting, um, even though it's got its flaws. Um, so yes. We'll just see what happens. So there we go. Uh, thank you very much for watching if you've been watching. So at the moment I am reading... Um, so yeah, I'm reading Within a, Within a Budding Grove, uh, number two of La Recherche. Um, I'm reading Gulliver's Travels, interestingly enough. Uh, and then I'm also slowly making my way through The Priory of the Orange Tree, which I will probably have finished by the end of next next month. Also by the end of next month, um, we will know who is on the Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist. So thank you for watching, if you've been watching. It's been a sort of uh, interesting one, hasn't it? And uh, yes, I shall see you very soon. So fare thee well. Bye. Even if you're on a carpet, it's a good idea to use a towel or mat to prevent the dust and fibers from getting into your nose and hair.